Yeah, as Jenny says, my name is Chris Paul. I'm the former chairman of the European Boxwood and Tapery Society in the UK. EBTS is a non-profit organisation that aims to encourage the appreciation, cultivation and knowledge of boxwood and topiary. We have groups in Belgium, France, Germany, the Netherlands and the UK, but our members are based all around the world. And for the next 20 minutes, we're going to look at some of the very basic and I feel uh, compared with everyone else who's spoken today, this is incredibly basic stuff, but it's my view that the basic stuff is absolutely necessary in maintaining topiary and hedges in historic gardens. Uh, first, we'll look at uh, the kit that you need for working on topiary. We'll major on plant health, particularly buxus and the box tree moth and caterpillar. And we'll end with some simple but effective tips that will make your life easier and help your plants. It will also make your visitors love your historic garden even more than they no doubt already do. So let's start by taking a look at the kit. And obviously the most important thing is your topiary shears. These are my favorites. They're the ARS K1000s. But in a poll of our members, they also came out liking the Nowaki and Okitsanu shears, all basically because they have extremely good sharp um, uh, steel uh, blades. Also, you'll need a very good pair of uh, secateurs. I really can't recommend enough that you try out different sizes of secateurs to make sure that uh, they fit with your hand because it makes a huge difference. And bearing in mind, you'll be using them pretty much all day. Um, really important thing to do. Uh, you also need for the detail work, some topiary clippers, and you'll need a pruning saw for when things get uh, slightly out of hand, although maybe a slightly bigger saw than that if they get as out of hand as the ones that David was just showing us. Cleaning, you need, uh, for, for Good cutting, you need good clean cuts, and for good clean cuts, you need sharp uh, blades, so you'll need yourself a whetstone, oil uh, for lubricating and stopping rust, and you'll also need disinfectant plus string to pull things into the right position. Definitely not wire, gets forgotten, then rusts and causes issues with your, your plants. So you've got the right kit, you need to have clean kit, not just the right kit. And sadly, this isn't something that in my experience happens enough. Tools quite often look more like this. I'm sure none of your, your secateurs look like this, but they're quite often way too muddy, caked on with resin and rusty, which means there's plenty of places for fungal spores and other infections to hide. Tools should look like this. These are mine. Clean tools mean that there are a few places for diseases to lurk, which means the material you're cutting into isn't going to get infected. And as I say, these are my tool, uh, these are my secateurs, and they do look like this pretty much all through the day. And as soon as they don't look like that, they get wiped. Clean tools are especially important when working for bo with box, and this is a box at Ham House uh, near Richmond in the UK, uh, where I was working last year. Tools were sprayed down between each of the topiary cones. So every different cone that I worked on, tools were cleaned down and every two to three meters of low box hedging. This regime also applies for power tools if you're using uh, electric hedge clippers. So spray down and wipe them off at regular intervals, intervals and definitely between each of your toperies. To help do this, I have a bucket. Uh, which includes a disinfectant spray. In my case, it's Citrox, which is a biodegradable citrus-based disinfectant. Other people use a 5 to 10% bleach water mix. Whatever you do, don't forget to label it so that everyone else knows what's in your spray can. You also, you obviously need a cloth for wiping off the resin and any debris that builds up. Also, a very useful item, Crenmate, which is a sort of rubbery pumice type stone. Um, and it will rub off any uh, stubborn resin that you might get as a, as a build-up. Uh, you'll need olive, uh, you'll need oil rather. Uh, some people use camellia oil, others will, like me, use either veg oil or uh, olive oil rather than petroleum-based uh, oils. So you've now got the right kit, you've got it all clean. Let's now look at uh, plant health. You need to think about the plant's roots, air movement around the plant, light and shading, competition from other plants, nutrition and pests and diseases. 
Now, before I move on, can I apologize for the first example? What I'm about to show you isn't the biggest issue, and I'm about to talk to you about, isn't the biggest issue in the picture, as you will see from the photograph, but it does demonstrate it quite well. We all like nice, clean uh, grass edges. Well, in this example, they've got a clean edge, but they do rather seem to have forgotten the grass. But what's it got to do with roots? Well, in this case, if you look, zoom in here, as you can see, the edges have been cut and exposed the roots. And in box hedging, the box roots are within the top 200 millimeters of the soil. So basically every time they're doing the grass edges here, they're effectively root pruning the plant. This doesn't mean you can't have nice clean edges. Just don't push your tools too far down like they have here um, and expose the roots within the soil. This applies to planting annuals and bulbs in, uh, in beds next to topiaries or hedges. Before you start, just think about where the plant's roots are. The potential damage that you could be causing to them by digging up close to your hedge or topiary. Try not to root prune them every year. This isn't something that happened in the next example. Here, the hedge is being used as a wall due to mulch and compost being built up year after year. As you can see, there's the mulch and compost at halfway up the hedge. This has reduced the air movement around the hedge and uh, the soil has blocked things. It's also exacerbated by the fact that they plant annual bedding plants right next to the hedge, which of course, again, disturbs the root and the plant was already badly stressed as it was also suffering from blight, probably caused by the lack of air movement. And this is what happens if you let the soil build up too high. You get secondary roots higher up the stems. If you then try to rectify the soil height by removing the excess, the roots then die, the plants become even more stressed and more susceptible to problems as it needs the moisture and nutrients that the extra roots had been providing to it. So try not to let the soil build up in the first place. Another thing you'll need uh, to do with the plants to get them to grow nicely is of course, get enough light in. In this case, the box hedge has been uh, had viburnum growing over, the, over it, depri depriving the whole of the back of the hedge of light. Consequently, there's little or no uh, leaf growth on the back of the hedge. Now, whilst box is naturally an understory plant, it still needs light to photosynthesize and grow. The answer in this case, obviously, was to, uh, to raise the canopy, and now there is regrowth happening on the back of the hedge. Here's another example where perennial growth is totally hiding the low box hedge that's running along the border. Consequently, the hedge had stunted sparse leaf growth. What was needed was a way to keep the perennials from flopping forward. And in this case, we used coppiced wood supports. And now the hedge is uh, growing healthily and the whole border looks absolutely wonderful. We also need to consider competing nutritional needs of all the plants that are growing in the beds. Make sure the soil is healthy and apply additional fertilizer where they need additional fertilizer to support all the plants. In the case of box hedging or topiary, if nutrients are needed, then add a dried seaweed fertilizer in the autumn. This, is, this allows it to be absorbed slowly over the winter. If you apply it in the spring, you will achieve lots of leaf growth, but this isn't how box normally grows. It's naturally a very slow grower. Quick growth induced by fertilizer is weaker and more susceptible to disease like blight. So let it grow naturally and do it, uh, plant, apply it in the autumn. It's also important to get light deep into your plants and regular pruning and clipping of hedges and topiary causes a, a very thick outer surface and light can't penetrate. Once you do get light into the plant, you'll get new growth as is shown here. This is important in the case of box as each leaf you take cut off has used two years worth of energy to grow. So every time you're clipping off the outer leaves, you're basically slowly depriving the plant of uh, its ability to uh, produce energy. So if you haven't got leaves inside the plant, the plant will go into long-term decline. To get light deeper into the plant, you can use a technique called thinning. This is the removal of around 10 to 20% of the dense outer growth. Now done correctly, it won't leave you with a load of holes and it won't leave you with a, a loss of definition on the plant surface. 
but it will let light deeper into the plant. It's backbreaking and tedious work, but one that's incredibly important for the health of our topiaries, and we really don't do it often enough. So please take the time to train up your people on how to do it so they can help it help you do it and share the work around. Pests also play a significant part in plant health, and I'm going to focus on just one today, the box tree moth and caterpillar, Cydolimia perspectalis. Unchecked, the caterpillar wreaks havoc, havoc in our parks and gardens. However, box is resilient, and assuming the bark isn't eaten off the stems, the plants aren't and the plants aren't defoliated too often, they will grow back. You can help this happen by applying nutrients, water, and removing debris caused by the caterpillar. And most importantly, stop further infestations. Repeated defoliation will cause plants to die of exhaustion. So remember, treatment is far cheaper than replacement. So to help understand how to stop the infestations, let's take a look at the life cycle of Cydolimia perspectalis, the box tree moth, with the help of some amazing video footage by Dr. Richard Roscoe. Starting with the eggs, these are small at around a millimeter in size and are laid in groups of up to 30. After three to five days, they hatch and the caterpillar transitions through seven instars over a period of about three to four weeks, depending on temperature and light. They then continue feeding for about two weeks before they pupate. This process takes about a week or so, depending again on temperature. When they, they then emerge as a moth and the whole process with a little interlude starts all over again. Now, female moths uh, start laying eggs around two to three days after their first flight and each female can lay between seven and 800 eggs over a two week lifespan. In the UK and Europe, their life cycle will then repeat two to three times a year. Now, a key point to remember is the pest overwinters as a caterpillar nestled between two leaves stuck together by its own webbing. It doesn't overwinter as an egg or a pupa. Why is that important? Well, if you can eradicate the young caterpillars in September and October before they overwinter, then they don't cause damage in the spring. Sadly, cold winters don't kill them off. They can survive down to minus 30, which is minus 22 Fahrenheit. Uh, it's good practice to start visual checks on your hedges and topiary in the spring when the temperatures start to warm up. The caterpillars wake up from their winter sleep when the temperature uh, averages around 10 degrees centigrade, and they start eating when the temperature gets to around 15 degrees. This causes windowing effects on the leaves, which become translucent. And it's important to then continue regular visual checks through to October or when temperatures drop below 10 degrees. Other signs of infestation are cobwebbing. Unlike spider's web, this goes in all directions, not just in one plane. The webbing pulls the leaves and branches together and forms a safer space for the caterpillar to hide whilst chomping through your, your beautiful topiary. Also look out for frass balls. This is the stuff that comes out the back end of the caterpillar after it's eaten your lovely buxus leaves. You'll find it in amongst the webbing and also dried up under plants. Now, some people think these are the eggs. They're not, the eggs are minute. This is actually what comes out the back end of the caterpillar, which is caterpillar excrement. You can also monitor for activity by looking for the moths by installing pheromone traps. They contain a lure which smells of the female moth, and this attracts the male moths, which drop through the funnel trap into the collector. Thankfully, Pheromone lures now last a full season, so you don't have to remember to replace them every six weeks or so. In the UK, we, we install our traps in early May, just before the moth's first flight. The traps are very useful to indicate uh, the start of activity, but also your pest pressure levels. So what other control measures are there? In most gardens, spraying is a, a practical proposition and there are a number of options. The most effective and EBTS's preferred option is to use a natural bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, in the UK, you can get it in the, under the product name of Diapel or Bruco. It's safe with humans, mammals, birds, fish, bees, and other pollinators. And in some countries it gets organic certification. BT, as I said, is a naturally occurring bacterium found in the earth and works by disrupting the caterpillar's gut. 
This stops the caterpillar eating after about an hour of ingesting a treated leaf. It's important to cover the whole of the leaf as much as possible with the spray. And you should start spraying as soon as you spot a caterpillar or 10 to 14 days after you catch your first moth. Bear in mind though, Bt is only effective for about a week as it breaks down under UV light. Uh, so you need to spray regularly. Obviously you can use chemical insecticides, but none are as quick acting as Bt. Worse, the chemicals are generally wide spectrum insecticides, which are dangerous to bees and other beneficial. So try to stick to something more like Bt. You can also use nematodes. You have to apply these three times at seven day intervals when the caterpillars are spotted. Difficult thing with nematodes are they're quite expensive and they're only around about 50% effective. Another option is to use trichogramma. These are small parasitic wasps. Bioline have a product called Tricholine, which uses wasps from the Drome region of the south of France. Supplied by post, the wasps are held in a cardboard container and they get out through the tiny holes. They don't open it up like I have here to show you the holes. The product is then hung inside the tapery and is biodegradable. Unfortunately, not available in the UK. DEFRA turned them down, but they are available around Europe. Another more recent product is M2I's uh, product called Box T, Pros Box T Pro Press. This is a mating disruptor that uses the same pheromone that's used in traps, but it's seven times stronger. And when it's applied, the whole area in which it's been applied smells of the, hum uh, smells of the female moth. And this means the males can't find the real females to mate with them. Consequently, fewer fertilized eggs are laid and therefore there's fewer caterpillars and less damage. We, we apply the, you apply the product twice a year first before the moths fly in May and again three months later. And in the trial we did at Ham House in the National Trust property, it was significantly reducing uh, the level of damage that we saw and additionally reduced the number of spraying of BT that we had to do from eight down to three. So are there any natural predators? Blackbirds, blue tits, jackdaws and others will eat the caterpillars, but only when they're easily visible. This means the caterpillars are quite large and therefore have already caused quite a lot of damage. Uh, there have been health concerns on birds feeding on caterpillars that have eaten leaves treated with wide action chemical insecticides. However, if you spray with Bt, there are no adverse effects to adults or fledgling birds. Wasps have also been seen attacking caterpillars, as you can see here in this video that we were sent by Louise Nichols. It looks like it's slightly chewed off the, the head of the caterpillar. Finally, something useful for wasps to do. And finally, I'd like to talk about some simple actions that have a dis disproportionately large effect. Uh, when planning your garden, don't just think horticulturally, focus on the areas that count and that your visitors see. This can include entry areas, anywhere where people congregate in and around cafes, for example, or photo opportunity points. These are the areas where people will spend time and will see the detail of your work. And one really good thing is to try walking through your property as if you're a visitor and see what you notice, what comes to mind and not just the horticultural things because some of your visitors won't notice those. And if you can, you've, you've got to try and appeal to all of your visitors. You can raise the canopy of your toperies or hedges. Uh, this has two useful effects. One, it makes clearing away the leaves much easier which makes things look neater and smarter. And the hedge and topiary will stand out more because you'll see a shadow underneath it which gives it definition in the ground. In the case of buxus, there's an additional incentive to doing this as it significantly reduces box blight infections because it stops spores splashing back up from the ground when it rains. Now, the other thing is don't try to do everything all at once, particularly if you're in a garden where people are paying to enter. Create a rolling program of works and limit the number of areas that are impacted so there are still areas of the garden where no work is happening and visitors can just see it as it's supposed to be. And very importantly, explain what you're doing so people are informed and don't make their own, make up their own uh, ideas about what it is you're doing. And almost certainly, uh, you can't afford to be a perfectionist much as we'd all like to be. So use the 80-20 rule. 
if your resources are limited. It's better to have 80% of the garden looking good rather than a couple of areas perfect and the rest uh, looking rather rough. So divide your time wisely. And finally, enjoy it. It really does show in the plants and believe me, your visitors will notice the difference. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen today. I hope at least some of those were practical ideas uh, were useful, um, if not as highbrow as some of the earlier speakers.